the Better Samaritan podcast, where we're learning how to love our neighbors well in a world filled with injustice and pain. Join me, Kent Annan, and Jamie Aiton, my co-host and colleague at the Humanitarian Disaster Institute at Wheaton College, as we interview experts with insight on learning to do good better. Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. I'm working really hard on season five of the show, which, God willing, will be an exploration of the rise of Christian fundamentalism in the United States. It's coming along really well, and I hope to release a trailer in the next few weeks, and hopefully the launch date right after that. Now, the fundamentalist movement had its birth in the 1800s and early 1900s. That era was marked by massive change and sometimes violent responses to modernization. As factories and workplaces became more efficient, there were real growth pains as owners and bosses struggled with workers. So I wanted to replay an episode from season three that talks about those struggles. This is one of the more controversial episodes I've ever done because some capitalist-minded evangelicals among us aren't always excited to learn about the role of labor unions in American history, but it will really help prepare you for season five. So no matter where you lean on economic issues, go ahead and give this one a listen. I should also apologize. At the point that I made this episode, I was still straining my voice to make things sound more exciting. I've been working away from that, but I don't have time to go back and fix all the old episodes, unfortunately. So this one's going to sound a little different than season five. Thanks to everyone who helps make this show possible. Thanks to your generosity last year, I was able to attend a podcasting conference, record on location in Tennessee at the site of the Scopes Monkey Trial, which is where season five will end, buy a much better microphone, a computer screen, a mixer, and more. Your support, letters, and comments really mean a lot. Okay, here's the show. There was an article in the September 1906 edition of Cosmopolitan, subtitled The Child at the Loom by Edward Markham. It tells a now famous story, and I I can't vouch for its validity, but here it goes anyway. There was a group of men on a tour. I don't know who they were or what they hoped to achieve, except that in their group was an American Indian. Maybe they wanted to see his reaction to such a big city. I mean, this was before cars took over, when the streets of New York were marked by pedestrians, horse-drawn carriages, and trolley cars. I'll post a video on the website and you can see it for yourself. Maybe they wanted to glimpse the city with fresh eyes, get the reaction of a stranger who had only known wilderness before this who didn't understand tall buildings or the new subway system. His hosts were Christian men. They walked him through the city with its modern streets, crowds of people in suits and hats, and so many factories. You can imagine the men were pleased, taking this in their mind uncultured savage and showing him the town. At the end of the tour, they asked their guest what he found to be the most striking thing. Was it the waterfront, the skyline, modern technology? No, not even close. The Native American said the most striking thing for him was working children. The 1800s saw the rise of the Industrial Revolution. New technologies cropped up right and left. Demand for consumer goods, mass-produced clothing, machinery, transportation. I mean, you remember this stuff from school, right? The dark realities that accompanied industrialization. People crammed into small and dirty tenements. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 1900, 25,000 children worked in textile mills in the South alone. Those were white children. Black children toiled in the fields. You can probably guess why in an era of Jim Crow laws. Kids worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. 
At the time, the Washington Post estimated that the average child lived only four years once they started at the mills. These were dangerous places filled with new machinery and chemicals and toxic gases. And these kids weren't alone. Many adults were there too, cutting, spinning, oiling, weaving, lifting in conditions that you and I would never stand for. To understand what happened with Christianity in the 1900s in the US and in Russia and why it is the way it is today, you first have to understand labor, factory conditions, struggles, and prevailing ideas about work. That Native American was wise enough to see that there were two stories going on, two competing interpretations of New York, both of them true, yet competing. One was the buildings, the hustle and bustle, the progress of industry, the other, the everyday struggles of normal people. You are listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Steren, and this is Truths. Our story will continue after these messages. This episode is brought to you by the Better Samaritan podcast with hosts Ken Annan and Jamie Aiden. The whole idea is we're looking at how do we do good better? The Good Samaritan helped out along the road, but then in Dr. Martin Luther King's sermon, he talked about how we want to also figure out why did the person get beat up along the road? So we want to make the whole road safer. So that's the that's where we're coming from on this podcast. Far too often, we've seen good Samaritans whose hearts were in the right place, but because they weren't also helping with their smarts, they actually ended up causing harm. So we really want to bring both our, our faith and look for biblical understanding, as well as what can research and science teach us to be able to help us do this work better. Most often, it's these small acts of kindness that make the biggest differences in the lives of our neighbors. And so on the podcast, we explore those small ways to get involved, those tangible, practical, concrete ways of what it means to love our neighbors. You can find Better Samaritan anywhere you get podcasts. This season has been full of great guests, and today is no exception. <laughs> Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Yeah, thanks for reaching out. Our guide for this episode is Heath Carter. Yeah, so I'm Heath Carter. I am a, an associate professor of American Christianity at Princeton Theological Seminary here in New Jersey. He's also the author of Union Made and an editor on several others, including The Pew and the Picket Line. He studied a lot about themes of Christianity and labor, working people's lives, um, the push and pull between church leaders and people in the pews. I think I could have talked to him all day. Anyhow, before we get into labor issues, before we talk about unions and socialism and the social gospel, we need to get into how churches make their money. Really, I mean, it's, it's an important part of the story. Just hold on a second. You'll see. Today, churches are funded by the people who go to them. But before the United States was its own country, we paid taxes, some of which went to funding churches. That's one way to keep the lights on or the candles burning or whatever it was back then, but along came the Constitution with its Establishment Clause that the government can make no law respecting one religion and threw a wrench into the whole works. Here. He's Professor Carter. So meaning that um, churches are not going to get any money from tax revenues um, and whatnot. So this is a pretty big deal. And now we had to ask this question, how are we going to pay for church? This is the way we had done it for a long time. Could churches survive? What we know now is that, and you know, a lot of debates about this, but, you know, sociologists and historians alike think that probably disestablishment ends up being a really good thing for the churches in terms of numbers and support that when you make church participation voluntary, as it becomes in the early United States, it, it 
unleashes certain dynamics that overall create more energy in the in the kind of church marketplace, if we can call it that. And there was nevertheless this kind of question, just very pragmatically, of how do we fund these organizations now? Maybe bake sales, walkathons, Etsy, start a Patreon page? There are no bad ideas during brainstorming, right? People could give money of their own volition, but passing the plate was not the only tool at their disposal. But one of the big funding mechanisms um, well into the modern U.S. really was pew rents. Pew rents. Like people could rent a place to sit in the service. You could choose a seat from a chart with prices on it. Pick a bench, pay the fee, and it's yours. And this was one of the big funding mechanisms. So uh, typically in a, in a church, the, the more front and center your pew, the more it costs. And you would often pay that on a quarterly basis. Pew placement was key. Not only was it a status symbol, but in the days before amplified sound, you had to sit kind of close to hear anything especially if your church wasn't designed for its acoustics. I mean, it's even stuff like, you know, seats, kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been to Wrigley Field, but they've got the old pillars and whatnot that that block the view from certain seats. And some churches have those same kinds of pillars. And so, you know, if you wanted to get a seat that was more affordable, you might look for one behind the obstruction, kind of, you know, and, and... So yeah, people were having very different kinds of experiences depending on where they were in in these sanctuaries. And that was part of the the critique as you get this kind of these egalitarian movements, people saying, look, we really think that churches should be places where the equality of of every human in God's eyes is, is better captured in the experience we're having in a worship service. Church is supposed to be a place where all of God's people come together. But we sometimes set up these barriers between us. I mean, even today, if someone rolls up on a Sunday morning in expensive clothes with the best mode of transportation and all you've got to wear is your old work clothes, you're going to feel kind of intimidated, unwelcome, maybe even get looked down upon. (laughs) Members of the clergy might also feel the temptation to favor people who pay pew rents. I mean, who are you going to listen to in a dispute? The person who pays your bills or the guy in the back who won't contribute financially? It's a problem we have in churches today, even without pew rents. You know, this is certainly, it's not certainly not to say that, you know, in 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 a nation like ours where church and state are separated in the ways that they are, that it means that clergy are always, you know, kowtowing to the wealthiest, but it's certainly a danger, you know, in certain, uh, yeah, times and places in, in particular moments in church history, you can see how those dynamics that are kind of just latent in the system all the time can produce what, what many people might regard as sort of troubling consequences. And it certainly seemed to many workers in post-Civil War America that the churches, which had they had kind of seen as these bastions of the common person, whereas in, in the colonial period, not that many people belonged to churches and not that many people um, were really deeply invested in church and, you know, sort of in institutions. Um, the, the people that were most invested tended to be the wealthy and their ministers tended to have degrees, kind of very fancy Ivy League degrees. This us and them thing caused animosity between the working class, the upper crust, and the clergy. Church looked like a rich man's game. The revolution unleashes these kind of democratic forces in American society, and all of a sudden you get the rise of lots of um, itinerant preachers on horseback and farmer preachers and, and just very ordinary people who feel empowered to pick up the Bible, read it for themselves, and proclaim the good news. And so churches in the early national experience, with you know some important exceptions, they do become more democratic. And, and uh, so a generation or two later, when you get the rise of these kind of, and you still see these today if you walk around, Um, older American cities, these kind of gorgeous brick and stone cathedrals that were built often in the mid to late 19th century, 
you know, many working people started to feel like that gap between church and the ordinary person's experience was widening again. And things like pew rents and clergy salaries and whatnot became uh, symptom symptomatic of that. You know, they were sort of uh, signs of a growing gap that um, many working people, ordinary people saw as not befitting uh, an organization, institution that claimed to be founded by a carpenter. The pastor's salary problem was real, too. The pastor of the Second Presbyterian Church in Chicago made $600 a year in 1842, more than triple the average canal worker. By 1873, he was making almost five times as much as the bricklayers in his area. That's a huge gap. Now, this wasn't true for all pastors, but some. And so, you know, that that tradition of of the churches as bastions of ordinary people of, of common life would be invoked throughout the late 19th century as kind of working people are trying to call the churches back to what they see as their their true mission, which is to to the ordinary people that that God also made and loves. After the Civil War, these pew rents became pretty controversial, in part, you could imagine, because it seemed like a kind of um, turning the church into a market or, or, you know, creating ways of funding churches that really discriminated against the poor, made it hard for poor people to find, you know, a, a, a literal place in, in these sanctuaries. The Civil War is one of those pivotal moments in U.S. history where you'll find yourself saying the world was a different place before the Civil War than it was after. Not only because of slavery, but also because of the way technology had changed. Like, really changed. People moved to big cities looking for work. You know, prior to the Civil War, a lot of people um, saw, and this was kind of along the lines of what someone like Jefferson had had in mind, that the nation would be a nation of um, small farmers, artisans, small shopkeepers, um, you know, the, the vision of a kind of corporate economy is not there for a lot of folks. And so not, you know, very few people are thinking in terms of systems and structures and inequality and in systems in the antebellum United States. Um, to the extent that that kind of thinking exists, it's especially common among enslaved people and free Black people who were much more attuned to the possibility that systems could be sinful than um, more than white Americans tended to be. Um, but after the Civil War, when you get the rise of really big corporations that stretch around the nation, I mean, the railroads are kind of the, the first example of this. You know, you get the the emergence really pretty quickly of a corporate economy. Jefferson's dream was just not a realistic scenario. Because in the U.S., just as in Russia at the time, there were tons of people flooding to the cities looking for work. Meaning that wages went way down because people were willing to work for less and less. Required to work 10 to 12 hour days, 6 or 7 days a week, just to scrape by. You can't work harder in that system doing those kind of hours because you're pushed to the max. Do you kind of understand the difference now? If so, you can see what the slaves saw, that the system itself could hold people back. Well into that period, you know, really up through the turn of the century and even beyond, there are still some people who are kind of living in the the earlier period. They still see, they don't see systems and structures. They see the ways in which it seems like you get out of the system what you put into it. So if you're poor, it's because you didn't try hard enough. And then if you're rich, it's because you were really diligent and industrious. And, you know, that, that kind of thinking, as you, as you point out, never fully goes away. This difference of opinion is still very much alive today. Do conditions of the system keep people down or does laziness and drunkenness? Since we humans are really bad at keeping two competing ideas in our heads at the same time, saying it depends or it could be a combination of both is just not in our wheelhouse. But you know, it should be, right? 
if you find yourself caught up in a system that will not let you succeed, you might be tempted to go to extremes to challenge your circumstances. That's how ideas like those of Karl Marx became appealing. Because at least he was willing to criticize to point out the system that kept people down. And in the process, got millions of people killed. To understand what came after all this, we have to glimpse into the world of what it was like to be a worker back then. It's really only by the, the mid 19th century, you know, so 1850s, 60s, 70s, that you start to get the rise of these big cities. A place like Chicago has you know, 100 people in 1830. But by 1900, Chicago was the fifth largest city in the world. Not the country, the world. Out of nowhere. This was pre-Navy Pier, pre-Field Museum, pre-weird reflective bean thing. It was not a nice place to live. People talk about the shock cities of, of this period because I mean, the reality was just that at every level, these were pretty inhumane environments. They were they were terribly polluted. They were um, housing conditions were atrocious. You know, I'm writing right now about a chapter about a woman named Mary McDowell who moved back of the yards in Chicago. This was one of the one of the kind of um, hardcore urban neighborhoods of this period, and she just talks about you know living a few blocks from these. Um, packing plants where animals are being slaughtered in a kind of industrial fashion and the, the the ways that she would wake up in the middle of the night choking because of the stench in the air. Horses were the main mode of transportation, which means a lot of <clears throat> waste in the streets and on your shoes and clothes. Then you had to go to work. You know, you, you have no protection and you have no uh you know many of the things that that had made work meaningful for people for a long time were also being kind of taken out of the system so whereas for centuries you have these these guilds right these are um societies of skilled workers who have uh you know closely guarded secrets you know whether you're a shoemaker or a barrel maker a cooper you know a blacksmith these were organizations, societies of workers that had guarded and preserved their the secrets of their trade over the course of a long, long time. With industrialization, skilled workers faced a real threat. Those trades and their secrets basically get exploded almost overnight. And you have, um, for example, in the packing plants in places like Cincinnati and eventually Chicago. Packing plants are where animals are killed and their meat is processed into... You know, steaks, chicken wings, ground beef, basically anything you'd put barbecue sauce on. It's it's actually, it turns out, uh, it takes a lot of know-how to really butcher a cow or a pig in, a, in, a, in, the, in the right way. And there are hundreds of cuts involved. And it would take a, a skilled master craftsman years to teach an apprentice how to make all those cuts and to do it right. And, and typically in the past, the apprentice would often have lived either in the house with the master craftsman and his family, or maybe just right nearby. And so there was this kind of relational dimension to the guilds as well. So it was possible for a person to get to know every single cut. If I slice here, we get pork chops. This area here becomes bacon. It's a skill. What happens in the, in the, in the meatpacking plants is that whole process gets divided up to where every worker is making, say, one cut. So now you have 220 people or whatever, each making one cut. So instead of identifying the rump roast, the meaty ribs, the pig's feet, knowing your trade, you might just make one cut. It was possible that your whole day, your whole career could be pork chops, pork chops, pork chops, pork chops, possibly pork chops. the rest of your life, meaning boredom and repetitive stress disorders. Meat was processed quickly, but it spelled unemployment for skilled workers. And what that means is, um, you know, it's faster and it's more efficient. Um, you, can, you can certainly slaughter a lot more animals that way. It also means that if you're on the line and either you cut your arm off um, because of, a, of an accident, because you're moving so quickly, the foreman on the factory floor is pushing you to move so quickly, 
um, you're easily replaced, right? You can just, someone else can slot in there and they spend an hour teaching you how to make that one cut and then boom, you're replaceable. Um, same thing if you have a complaint about your working conditions, right? If you have a, if you feel like you're being underpaid, if you feel like your supervisor is abusing you, if you, well, you could complain, but you have to also face the reality that there's hundreds of, of people right at the door waiting to get that spot in the line to make that one cut that they can teach him how to make in one hour. Really think about that. No safety net. No job security. The 1800s were a time of crazy economic upheaval. There was a recession from 1865 to 1867. Then another one two years later followed by one in three more years, and another one three years after that, meaning that the typical worker in a factory could not afford to lose their job because they were constantly in some kind of recession and there might not be another place to go. And so your leverage as a worker, you know, to be able to kind of negotiate a fair wage or, fair or, or reasonable working conditions was really minimal. And that, that was at the heart of many of the debates that were happening. I mean, you had a lot of folks saying that labor unions were, were wrong because they, they got in the way of the workers' God-given right to negotiate the contract for his or her labor with their employer. Uh, but then you have people, and, and the labor unions are a major uh, force for this argument, saying, well, wait a minute. If you've got someone else at the door waiting to take my job, what what grounds do I really have to have any kind of negotiation over the terms of my work? If there are hundreds of workers willing to take your place, and if you're not really all that skilled, you can't go somewhere else. I mean, you've got no leverage, at least not alone. And it's really only if all of us come to the table together that we're going to have any real serious chance at having an open negotiation over the value of what we're bringing to the table here. And so that, that's sort of the, some of the, the context for the, the arguments that begin to really intensify in the late 19th century. We can go back and forth all day about whether or not you like unions. Like I said, we humans are terrible at keeping two competing ideas in our heads. We either want to support unions no matter what, or we're totally anti-union. For the time being, keep those two ideas in tension. Find a middle ground. It'll make the next couple of months on this show a lot easier for you. Now that you know about the working conditions in the 1800s and early 1900s, what role do you think that Christians should have played? Is it right for pastors to step in and make a public statement, or as some did, should they avoid picking a side so that more people might hear the gospel? There are no easy answers there. We can see this play out in the battle for the eight-hour workday. The fight for the eight-hour day is something, you know, uh, in recent history, many of us have, have taken for granted. Now, I think with the rise of the gig economy, actually, the eight-hour day is maybe back under some kind of threat in certain ways. But, but in relatively recent history, uh, an eight-hour day was something that seemed very normal to many American workers. Um, that was a really hard-fought, decades-long battle that really began, as you suggest, right after the Civil War. And you know, in Chicago and across the state of Illinois and, and really across much of the country, in 1867, you have this huge general strike for the eight-hour day. You know, part of what was interesting about this was that um, in, in Chicago and across the state of Illinois, actually the legislature had passed a law instituting the eight-hour day. And so it seemed like this was a, 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 a fight already won. There were too many loopholes and big corporations took advantage of those loopholes. So workers staged a massive walkout to get the attention of the powers that be. They fully expected, many of those workers, that the churches would have their back. Um, they really believed that, that the clergy would back them. They were framing this whole movement in terms of reform and uplift. They wanted workers to have uh, eight hours for work and eight hours for recreation, time with their families, time to read and, and just to kind of uh, be uplifted in their lives, and then eight hours for rest. And they saw this as very 
um, sort of much in line with kind of the the vision of a Christian America, um, to be honest. And and so they were deeply dismayed and had, in many cases, a sense of betrayal um, when across the country, across Illinois, Chicago, much of the country, um, the churches largely either stay on the sidelines or in, in many cases actually uh, denounce the, the movement. The churches didn't always have their back. Imagine what a sucker punch that would have been to see your movement as bringing Christian principles to the workplace and then have your pastor ignore it or even denounce it. Talk about a crisis of faith. The reasons for that are complicated, but but certainly for many workers, they, they experienced it as a betrayal and they saw the fact that the clergy had become too close to the wealthy. All of a sudden, these beautiful church buildings and the pew rents and clergy salaries and all those things, which the, you don't find a lot of complaints about um, in the 1850s, say. But by the 1860s and 70s, all those things suddenly take on a new meaning. As it seems like the churches are kind of lining up with bosses, those buildings and those salaries start to seem like evidence of the betrayal. And that becomes a, a kind of, um, you know, source of a lot of moral indignation on the part of workers for decades. This is a topic we're going to cover for the next few weeks. So let's take the rest of our time to ponder some big ideas. First, let's frame this challenge that I've given you about labor, about avoiding extremes with two competing ideas. There's this quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald that I think about a lot. You've probably heard it. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. He went on to give an example of what he meant. One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. Two opposing ideas. That it's hopeless to do something, and yet believe that you're going to try anyhow. That's a pretty good example. Realizing that two things can be true at the same time. Working conditions were terrible back in the day. Workers formed unions. Now, if we stop there, we've got a nice, tidy little narrative. Uncomplicated. And pro-union people would really like it. But it's too easy. Because even a cursory study of labor unions in the 1980s and 90s will turn up not only health benefits, a living wage, and safety standards, but also in some unions, graft, thuggery, and in the case of the union at GM, prostitution and illegal drugs. Those of you who are anti-union may only see that side of the story. The challenge going forward is to see both. Think about that tour from the beginning of the show. A group of Christians walking a Native American through New York City. I love this story because it cuts to the heart of the issue. We get so dazzled by progress, the titans of industry like Rockefeller and Carnegie, of their empires, of contributions to efficiency, the way they helped usher in the modern world. And we miss the children working in sweatshops. Both parts of the story are true. To only focus on one is to miss the point. These struggles went on to shape Christian America, the role of churches in social movements, the way we see politics and religion. It wasn't long until pastors, priests, and lay Christians picked a side. As we'll see, in many ways, the bonding of Christianity, capitalism, and the United States got its start right here. The rise of public displays of piety in government, like the National Prayer Breakfast, God being mentioned on our money, and more, were backlashes against the labor movement. As free market libertarians used the Cold War to tie Jesus to the American way. That's it for this rebroadcast of Truce. Special thanks to Heath Carter, who was excellent as the guest on this episode. 
You can find more about him in your show notes and also by going back and listening to the sequel of this episode, which is in season three. Truce is a listener-supported podcast. If you'd like to be a part of this crazy different show, visit trucepodcast.com slash donate. Remember to subscribe to the show so you get every new episode as it's released. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks for your comments. God willing, we'll talk again soon. The Better Samaritan Podcast, where we're learning how to love our neighbors well in a world filled with injustice and pain. Join me, Kent Annan, and Jamie Aiton, my co-host and colleague at the Humanitarian Disaster Institute at Wheaton College, as we interview experts with insight on learning to do good better.